Hello, I'm Jay Cross. I'm in Berkeley, California right now. And I want to talk with you this morning a little bit about informal learning. Informal learning. By that I mean learning that doesn't have a set curriculum. Usually there's no required time to be there. More often it's you learn when you need something and there's no grade or certificate or a check mark in a learning management system when the learning is completed. This is really natural learning before we invented a lot of the artifice and things that go with schooling, if you will. Five years ago, almost to the day, I heard a presentation by Peter Henschel, who was then head of the Institute for Research on Learning. And he told us that most learning for work doesn't happen in training classes. It happens informally. It happens from watching people who know what they're doing, from asking questions, from trial and error, from looking something up in a book. All these things that aren't training at all that they learn. And I, I talk with Peter and I talk to the folks at the Institute and I, as I dug into it, secret, my real background is in business way back when. So I dug into it, I realized we had the, what I call the, the informal learning paradox in that on the job, 80% of the learning is informal, but in the budget, 80% of the money is spent on formal learning. And I thought, well, sounds to me like there's an opportunity to balance a few things there. So I started looking into it. And let me stop and say, I'm very uncomfortable giving a presentation. Because a presentation pre, before, sort of assumes that I'm the authority. I'm not, I'm, I'm with you on this. Uh, I'm much more a fan of conversation. I was going to a conference yesterday, and I shut up about five minutes before I was supposed to go on, and just out of my mouth popped that, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to be here because I want to see what I've got to say. And so while these are topics I know well, the conversation we'll have, like improvisational theater, is whatever comes out of my mouth. It, it's very free form. I wish that I could be, you know, looking at your faces as I do this for cues about what excites you, but I just have to imagine that for now. Our world is going ever faster. Ray Kurzweil, who's a brilliant scientist, has done analysis for what he sees as the coming of the singularity. When everything is just coming together so fast, it's totally off the charts. In fact, Ray has looked at not just Moore's law, but other things that have accelerating progress rates, such things as oh, communications or the evolution of humans. He went back and charted from the, right before the, Invention of agriculture through the current day, major paradigm shifts is measured by oh, Encyclopedia Britannica and Carl Sagan and lots of other sources. And he plotted these along a time scale. And he found that indeed all of human progress is sort of accelerating exponentially. And that if you look at the 21st century, we're not going to have a hundred years, say 20th century type years, but we're going to have 20,000 20th century type years. That We're right now on sort of the shallow part of an exponential curve and you can sort of feel it if you look at your email or the newspaper. And boy, things are happening a lot faster now. You know, one of your minutes is not like one of your grandmother's minutes. And we're on this, this rocket sled, which is going to mean that the whole way we've looked at training and development will be obsolete. We used to have the luxury of time that we could develop programs and take best practices and drill folks in them and learn those and then go for a while. But now, increasingly, learning has to be day by day, minute by minute, 
it, it's no longer in the books. It is improv like this presentation. It's what comes and how you respond to it. Knowledge is no longer set down in the, the job descriptions or the, the rules. Well, a lot of you people are in government, so you do have rules, but uh, <laughs> it's increasingly knowledge is interpretation and it's a, a shared understanding that we have as sort as what what's good enough to get through, what makes sense, what's the know-how more than the knowledge, if you will. I'm going to take a look at my little mind map. I, I do scribble something for five minutes before I talk. Just to make sure I don't throw you totally off. And, well, let me talk a little about the technology. After talking with hundreds of folks and lots of large organizations as well as uh, the small and a number of scientists, I, I came to the conclusion that the most important learning technology, without doubt, is human conversation. And a lot of how to pay attention to informal learning, to manage or at least uh, try to improve that 80% of the way that people learn is to enable conversation to happen, to get out of its way. John Akers, when he was presiding over the sinking ship that was IBM a while back, went to Canada and was talking with the workers in the factories and he said, look, these are desperate times. I'm going to need all of you to help me through this. And I don't want to see anybody just standing around the water cooler talking. And Akers had failed to realize that among knowledge workers, talking's the work. I mean, that's the way that they shared ideas. That was collaboration and action. And he just stopped it. I hope you're familiar with the term communities of practice. And if you're not, Stephen cut this off and give the uh, UK equivalent of communities of practice because it's the way lots of professionals really stay sharp, innovate, and learn to work. A community of practice is a group of people who uh, share a, a, a common trade or interest. I, chefs. Chefs are an amazing community of practice. Now, they're, they're not affiliated and they don't carry little chef membership cards. But boy, they know each other, they network like crazy. Chef's never out of a job. Because he or she is so glued into the network that he can sort of put out a signal and know what people are hiring and other people will help him or her along. Chefs, when they, when they go on vacation, they go to chef bars, they talk to practice. Now, they're, they're not affiliated and they don't carry little chef membership cards. But boy, they know each other, they network like crazy. Chef's never out of a job. Because he or she is so glued into the network that he can sort of put out a signal and know what people are hiring and other people will help him or her along. Chefs, when they, when they go on vacation, they go to chef bars, they talk with other chefs, they live by trading secrets with chefs. This is a community of practice. For a long time, communities of practice were thought to be accidental. They just, you know, came together and sort of grew. They grew like truffles. Now, truffles, as you're aware, grow in the wild. They uh, can't be cultivated. You take out your trained dog or your trained pig and have them sniff around the roots of oak, tree, oak trees. And when they find something, boy, they dig.